A campus radio station is going to be in action. An interviewer is interviewing a man from the university for the survey. Listen to the conversation between them and circle the best answer from A, B, or C for questions 1 to 4. You now have some time to read questions 1 to 4. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will never hear the recording for the second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Excuse me, I'm conducting a campus survey. Would you have time to answer a few questions? What's it all about? We're doing some market research for a new campus radio station starting in the next few months. That's okay. Sounds good. Great. I'll just work through this form with you, and if we could start with some personal background information. Sure. Right. If I could have your age, please. Twenty-six. Okay. Good. And are you a student, teacher, or in another job? Well, I'm a tutor, but I'm also a postgraduate student, so I don't know what you might call me. What do you think? Okay. Well, I'm more of a teacher, really. Fine. And would you mind if I asked about your salary, or I could leave it blank? No, that's okay. It's twenty thousand dollars a year. Thanks. Right. Now about your current listening habits. What would you say is your main reason for listening to radio? Well, I'm usually busy during the day at work, so I usually only listen to the radio at night. It helps me relax and unwind, even if I'm studying. Good. And how many hours a day, on average, do you listen to the radio? Well, not a lot, really. I'd say just over an hour, all told. Now you have some time to read questions five to ten. Now listen to the second part of the interview and answer questions five to ten. So, what are the two main times of the day that you listen to the radio? Well, for a little while around breakfast time, and then it tends to be later after dinner, when I've finished any serious work I need to do. And what sort of radio programs do you like? I like the news, but I also like classical music. It helps me to relax. Fine. And turning to the new campus station, which type of programs would you prefer? I think the existing radio stations cater for my need for news, so I'd like to see programs about local information. You know, providing a service to the campus community, and in the same vein, perhaps more for academic viewers. You know, some lectures or relevant programs.、Oh, I see. And if you had to give the new director some specific advice when they set up the station, what would you tell them? I think I'd advise them to be careful about the quality of the broadcasts. You know, the sound system. There are a lot of radio stations, and people can change their loyalty quickly if it doesn't meet their needs. I think they should do more of these kinds of interview too. You know, talking with existing and potential customers. Oh, I'm pleased you think it's useful. Certainly, yeah. Good. Now this station will not be fully funded by the university. So how often do you think it is tolerable to have adverts? I think, well, out of that list, I'd say every quarter of an hour. Of course, that's providing they don't last for ten minutes each time. Oh, quite. And are you interested in attending any of the special promotions for the new station? Yes, I'd be happy to. 
as long as they're held on the campus or nearby. Okay, I'll note that down. And finally, may we put you on our mailing list? Well, I prefer not, except for the information about the promotions you just mentioned. Okay, can I have your name and address? Of course, I have a card I can give you. Oh, great! And thanks a lot for your time, and we look forward to seeing you. Yeah, sure.、Mm, thanks. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear a lecturer talking to students about a printing process. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fifteen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to fifteen. As I've made clear in earlier lectures, many different solutions have been proposed to the basic technological problem of getting meaningful marks onto paper. In other words, several different forms of printing have developed over the years, many of which are still in use today for different purposes. This week. I'd like to discuss the rotogravure process. This is one of the most widely used printing processes, and after describing how the process works, I'll be describing some of its industrial uses and the advantages and disadvantages of this form of printing. As the name implies, rotogravure is a form of printing in which large cylindrical pieces of metal rotate, while the paper to be printed passes between them. The paper is held in place against the printing surface by the impression roller. The weight of this roller is one of the factors that affect how much ink is actually transferred to the paper. Remember that this roller does not directly transfer ink onto the paper. The side in contact with the impression roller remains blank, and it's the other side of the paper which is actually the printed side. The impression roller presses the paper against the ink-bearing roller. Generally known as the gravure cylinder, this roller is etched or engraved using either a laser or a diamond-tipped etching machine. This creates a large number of tiny holes in the surface of the roller, which hold the ink. The depth and size of these holes determines how much ink is picked up from the ink fountain, which the whole printing assembly rests in. How much ink is picked up in turn determines the density of the image produced. As it rotates, the lower roller picks up more ink on its surface than is required, and this needs to be removed before contact with the paper. A flat edge called the doctor blade scrapes against the surface and removes all ink which is not in one of the holes on the surface of the lower roller. This should lead to a clean image. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions sixteen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions sixteen to twenty. Now that we understand a little of the mechanics of rotogravure printing, I'd like to look at it in the wider context of the printing industry and discuss the main uses. One of the main advantages of the rotogravure process 
is that the amount of ink which can be transferred to the paper is high compared to other printing methods. This means that a broad density range can be produced. In other words, with rotogravure, it's possible to produce many different light and dark shades, making it particularly suitable for reproducing photographs and fine art. For shorter print runs, some other processes may give a finer image, but rotogravure is ideal for jobs that involve printing, for example, a million magazines. One common place where you'll see printed matter that has been produced by rotogravure is in the advertising material that is often inserted into Sunday newspapers. Of course, it's not just paper that can be printed by rotogravure. It's a very flexible process, since the rollers used can be made to any size required. Whether it's consumer packaging or large rolls of floor covering that need to be printed, rotogravure is a relatively cheap, quick method that is used in a variety of industries. This isn't to say that rotogravure is without its disadvantages. Probably the main drawback is the fact that, with large areas of colour, the dots are visible, even without using any kind of magnifying aid. Now, does anyone have any questions about the rotogravure process? That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. I have with me today Matthew East, a registered osteopath and a supporter of alternative techniques in healthcare. Matthew, can you tell us more about osteopathy? First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Over the past 50 years, there have been some radical changes in medicine as it is known in the West. This is largely the result of vast improvements in technology, but also in the rising importance of alternative treatments. I have with me today Matthew East, a registered osteopath and a supporter of alternative techniques in healthcare. Matthew, can you tell us more about osteopathy? Well, perhaps the first thing I should say is that the term alternative is actually a little misleading, as I am referring to approaches and attitudes to health that were in common use long before Western medicine was established. I prefer the term natural. Anyway, I'll begin by telling you a little about osteopathy. Basically, osteopathy is the manipulation of muscles in order to alleviate stresses and tensions that lead to pain. Now, unlike Western medicine, osteopathy considers the whole body, not just the affected area. And this is a very important principle of natural remedies. The whole body must be considered before a course of treatment can be decided upon. You see, the aim of therapies like osteopathy is not only to repair the body, but also to get the body treating itself. And this does not come from treating the symptoms. To give an example, I recently treated a two-month-old baby who was screaming all day and was even worse at night. The couple had taken the baby to their doctor, but the only advice they were given was that the baby would grow out of it. However, the real problem stemmed from a difficult birth, 
which put pressure on the baby's neck. After ten minutes of gentle manipulation, the pressure was released, and within twenty minutes the baby was quiet and calm for the first time. This was achieved without drugs or operations. Avoiding such invasive methods of treatment highlights another of the differences between Western medicine and a more natural approach. You see, Western medicine often uses surgery in order to find a solution to problems that could have been addressed with simple remedies. A medical approach that looks closely at how essential an operation is before it is performed would offer patients a considerably less stressful method of treatment, not to mention the financial savings. Natural remedies actually amount to about 10% of the cost of a Western course of treatment. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. I'd like to mention the subject of surgery again a little later, but I would like to say at this point that there are those that claim that the benefits of osteopathy and herbal therapies are largely psychological, that they have not undergone the clinical trials that pharmaceuticals have. To answer that, you only need to look at the example I gave earlier of the baby that stopped crying less than an hour after treatment, but was obviously far too young to react because of purely psychological factors. Another example can be seen in the successful use of acupuncture in the treatment of animals. In response to criticism regarding clinical trials, it is worth noting that the power of pharmaceutical companies is such that, although some drugs fail the standards required of them, they are sometimes still prescribed by doctors. Moving on to another point, it should be stressed that natural remedies, in addition to having no side effects, can also be applied to any patient. Now, I'm not suggesting that the same treatments are used indiscriminately. Although natural remedies can be used with any age group, the treatment selected is very specific to the person. By this I mean that not only the general health of the patient needs to be considered, but also their habits, diet, and lifestyle in order to build a complete picture. However, I am not suggesting that we should reject Western medicine entirely. In fact, there have been occasions when I have referred patients to their doctor, as I felt that in those cases it was the most suitable course of action. There are many situations in which it is by far the best option. Take emergency surgery, for example. Obviously, more natural remedies do not provide the speed required in such cases. The best solution would therefore be an open-minded combination of the two forms. Well, thank you very much, Matthew. That was a very interesting insight into alternative, sorry, natural treatments. Next week, we'll be inviting Dr. Moore. That's M-O-O-R-E e onto the program to argue his case as a doctor until next week then goodbye that is the end of part three you now have half a minute to check your answers Now turns to part four. Part four. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. The word thesaurus comes from Greek and means treasure house. So, to tell us more about Roger's thesaurus is linguist Dr. Cindy Channer. Now then, Cindy, we know Roger classified the English language. Well, the 150th edition has just come out. It sold 32 million copies. Yes, that's right, 32 million. What is it? Roger's thesaurus. Now, Roger's thesaurus is a type of dictionary in which words with similar meanings are grouped together. The word thesaurus comes from Greek and means treasure house. So, to tell us more about Roger's thesaurus is linguist Dr. Cindy Channer. Now then, Cindy, we know Roger classified the English language, but what do we know about the man himself? Well, Mr. Roger, or to give him his full name, Peter Mark Roger, was a very interesting man indeed. He grew up in London, he was French, and he spent his early life in a French community there. He later travelled all the way from London to Edinburgh to study medicine at the university there and graduated when he was 19 years old. And he later went on to become a founder of Manchester Medical School. So his life focused around his career as a doctor? Well, actually, no. Roger had a very wide range of interests indeed. In fact, he was a writer and wrote about many topics such as bees, the kaleidoscope, and even perception and feeling in animals. And he was an inventor too. In fact, in 1814, he invented an early version of the slide rule. The slide rule? Yes, the device that can calculate numbers. Then ten years later, he developed a prototype for the cine camera. And he also got involved in a range of different projects. For example, he became head of a commission investigating London's water supply, and he developed a method of water filtration through sand. And he was involved in the area of education. He was one of the founders of London University. And do you play chess by any chance, Mark? Yes, I do. Well, Roger invented the travelling chess set. So next time you're playing a game of chess on a train, you have Mr Roger to thank. So... How did he actually find the time to classify the English language? Well, he only turned his full attention to the thesaurus when he retired, and that was when he was in his 70s. So what inspired him to write the thesaurus? Well, Roger believed that he should bring as much happiness and knowledge to the greatest number of people. So, during his career as a doctor, he gave free treatment to patients who couldn't afford to pay. We also know that he set up a clinic to help poor people to recover from operations and serious illnesses. Basically, he wrote the thesaurus to help people learn. He aimed to help those who needed practice in writing. He believed that writing skills would help people become more independent and lead happier lives. How popular is the thesaurus today? Well, it was first published in 1852 and it has never been out of print since. In fact, the book has become more popular with each edition that comes out. The invention of the crossword puzzle in 1913 certainly helped to increase the sales figures, though. I think the main reason why it is so popular is that it's thematic. So you can come across words that you've never even thought of when you began looking for the word in the first place. Thanks, Cindy. Now join us again after this short break, when I'll be talking to Derek Spode, chairperson of East Anglian News. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.